He is risen. Warren, thanks, brother, for giving us some good resurrection music today. Jesus said that a wicked and adulterous generation looked for a sign. But you remember what kind of sign he said would be given? He said it would be the sign of Jonah. We are in the book of Jonah today as we are looking at selected minor prophets. I've only got six weeks with you to look at minor prophets, so we are looking at six of them. You might be saying, why in the world would you be preaching Jonah? Come on, Mike. Everybody knows Jonah. Everybody knows the story of Jonah. Do you think you're going to tell us anything we don't know about Jonah? Probably not. But let's don't ever get so familiar with Scripture that we stop finding the wonder in it. But I will say this, while Jonah may be one of the most recognizable and well-known figures in Scripture, and maybe the story of Jonah is one of the well, most well-known stories in Scripture, I'm not sure that the book of Jonah is really known all that well. In fact, I don't know how many of you saw, about a year or two ago, this video started going viral. Do you all remember this? A little girl in a church telling the story of Jonah. How many of you saw that video? It went viral. It got millions of hits, remarkably gifted. I mean, we're talking little girl here, telling like a seven and a half minute rendition of the whole story of Jonah. She's brilliant. The problem with the video is not that she gets the story so incredibly wrong at its foundational points, but it's the adults in her life who have taught her the story of Jonah so fundamentally wrongly. And that the video went so viral by Christians sending it around and sharing it on Facebook who did not realize that the very heart of the story was not there. I'm not criticizing the little girl. I'm criticizing the people that have not taught her the story of Jonah. Let's revisit Jonah today and then consider the relevance for Jonah in our lives. Let's just first kind of go through this story. And it begins with God calling Jonah. He called Jonah. We're in Jonah chapter 1. In the very first verses, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise! Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. You know, we don't know that much about Jonah the man. The only other reference to the prophet Jonah is in 2 Kings chapter 14, where he is introduced as a prophet, the son of Amittai, during the reign of Jeroboam II of Israel. He's in the northern kingdom. Jeroboam II reigned from 782 to 753 B.C. That does not mean that's the only time Jonah had his ministry, but at some point during that reign, at least part of Jonah's ministry happened. He was told to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is described by God as a great city. I want you to think about this. In ancient cities, a city of 120,000 people was a massive, massive city. They they built these walled cities, and a city large enough for 120,000 people was a huge, huge place. In fact, we are told in the book of Jonah that it was three breadth, three days breadth. Now, does that mean it took three days to walk from one side to the other and it took three whole days to get around the city? I don't know exactly, but this was a big city. It was a major city for the Assyrian empire and eventually became the capital of Assyria. And Jonah was called to go preach against this city. I want you to think about that. He was called to preach against it. Isn't that interesting, the the word usage there? God says, I want you to go preach against it. In other words, the message he's given is not, Jonah, I want you to go tell these people just how much they're loved. I want you to go tell these people how how great I am, and and I want you to go tell them. God gives him a very specific message, and the message is a message of judgment against this city. It was a wicked city, horribly wicked place. Not only was it wicked in in that they had their pagan worship, but the the Ninevites were known for being a specifically and especially cruel and violent people. They had some unusual punishments. They would punish people by cutting their lips off. They would punish people by tearing strips of skin. They would cut strips of skin off of them and hang those strips from the trees in public so that people could see them. It's a horrible place, and it's to this city that Jonah the prophet is called. But as we all know, Jonah ran. He ran, didn't he? Verse 3 says, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish 
from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. By the way, if you're ever going to preach Jonah, you just need to prepare yourself. Tarshish is hard to say. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of of the Lord. Now, where's he going? Look at this map that we have here. It's not a great quality map, but you can see uh, over at the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, you can see he went to Joppa. Now, from Joppa, you see Nineveh is way in the northeast part of this map. And so, northeast of there is where he's supposed to go, but he goes. And in fact, it's even cut off. It's way, way over there, like on the coast of Spain or Portugal over there is where Tarshish is. So, basically, what he's doing is he's wanting to go as far as he can possibly go on a ship. I mean, if you're sailing to Tarshish and you miss it, your next stop's North Carolina. There's nothing past that for them to go to. So this is way, way out there. Why is Jonah running away? Is it because he's afraid? Well, it could be that there is some fear in there. I mean, I want you to think if God right now gave a call to your life and said, I want you to go to Tehran. And here's, here's the call I want to give to your life. I want you to go to Tehran. I want you to go to the middle of the city. I want you to walk around in the public places. And I want you to cry out a message of judgment against that city. Would you be afraid? I'd be terrified. I'd be terrified to do that. We know that they're not very kind to uh, Christians, especially if we were to preach out publicly like that. The problem, however, I don't think was his fear as much as his hatred. He didn't like these people. Not only was it just that they were non-Jews, but I want you to think of who his contemporaries were. Isaiah came on the scene in 740. Earlier than that, the time of, uh, of Jonah was also the prophet Amos. And what were the messages that Isaiah and Amos were prophesying to the people of the northern kingdom? They were prophesying a message of judgment. They were calling for repentance. They were preaching a message of judgment. And who was God going to use to bring judgment on the northern kingdom? It was the Assyrians, was it not? So of all the people on the planet that Jonah would have had an affinity for, it would not have been the Assyrian people. In fact, it was in 722 that the Assyrians indeed conquered the northern kingdom. But you might say, but it's a message of judgment. Maybe he would have been happy about preaching judgment against those Ninevites. But that wasn't his problem. We're going to see later he knew that they would repent. He knew God would spare them. He knew He knew God loved these people, so he ran. I don't think he ran to hide either. This was a prophet of God. A prophet of God knew he couldn't hide from God. This was an act of rebellion against God. Short and simple. He was rebelling against God. He ran, and that's when things got ugly. Verse 4 says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up then the mariners were afraid now i have to tell you for these hardened mariners to be afraid it must have been bad it must have been really really bad i was on a ship i was doing some port ministry with the global maritime ministries one time and we went on a ship and it was a ship that was uh, disabled and it was just sitting there for months and so we went on and we were ministering to the to the seamen on the ship and one of the officers asked if we'd like a tour it's really cool we got to go down in the engine room we got to go on the bridge but in the bridge there was a framed photograph hanging of this very ship taken from the bridge of this ship in 60 foot seas I started getting queasy just standing there, watching, looking at this picture. And I asked the officer, and he was telling me about it. He was, he was on the bridge when this was happening. And, and I said, were you terrified? And he looked at me like I had three heads. He said, no. Like, why would I be scared? I was scared. Look at it. I would have been screaming like a little girl had I been in that scenario. What does it take to scare one of these guys? And here are these sailors who had seen it all, and they were terrified. So they prayed to their gods. They started throwing the cargo overboard. And we need to realize that Jonah's disobedience placed every life around him in danger. And where was he? Amazingly, he slept through it all. He's so oblivious. This man's so self-centered. He's just so caught up into himself. He doesn't even realize what's going on around him. So they woke him up and asked him, hey, pray to your God. You know, it's interesting. We have no indication that he did pray to his God. 
Because really, when we are in rebellion against God, God's the last person we want to communicate with. Isn't that true? They cast lots. They found out that it was Jonah that was the problem. They said, what did you do? He fessed up. He told them exactly what he'd done. He didn't repent. He just said, just throw me overboard. They wouldn't do it. They didn't want to throw him overboard. So they rode harder. They're crying out to their gods. Finally, the situation was hopeless. So they prayed to Jonah's God, and they said, please don't hold this against us. And they tossed him overboard. When they did, the sea became calm, and they worshipped Jonah's God. And then what? Well, a fish gulped. Here's the big question we hear when we talk about Jonah. What, what was it? What kind of fish was this? Was it a whale? It doesn't say whale, it says fish. And you know, they've had documentaries about Jonah and they've talked about what kind of fish could do this. And it must have been a shark because a whale couldn't have done it. A whale has a small throat, I understand. And so it had to have been a shark or something like that or maybe some sort of fish that we don't know about that doesn't exist anymore. I'm going to settle this. I'm going to tell you what this was. It was a miracle. Who cares what kind of fish it was? This was a supernatural occurrence that God caused to take place. We believe in a God who exists outside of the physical realm and can do whatever he wants to. And I want to encourage you not to be embarrassed by that. So he's in this fish. He's alive for three days. How is he kept alive in this fish? It was a miracle. So Jonah relented. It doesn't say Jonah repented. It says he relented. He praised God. He thanked God for sparing his life. And the fish vomited him. And he wound up on dry land. Jonah chapter 3, verse 3. You thought we were doing every verse, didn't you? So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey In breath, he went. There was no indication he was happy about going. There was no indication he was excited about this new adventure in his life. There was no indication he just fell in love with these Ninevites. He went. Do you ever wonder what his preaching was like? Have you ever listened to an unhappy preacher? It's awful, isn't it? It's terrible. I was at a conference a couple of years ago sitting and listening to a, a preacher. He was just mad. I mean, he, I don't know who he was mad at. I thought he was mad at me. His face was red and he was yelling and screaming. And boy, he was just mad. I did not enjoy myself. I don't know what it was like. But Jonah chapter 3 verse 4 says, Jonah began to go into the city. Going a day's journey and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He didn't want to do it, but he did it. And look at this. Nineveh responded. They fasted. They put on sackcloth. Why in the world? Who responds to a message like that? They were confronted with their sin and they were broken. God did a mighty work here. The word got to the king. The king repented. The king issued a decree in verses 7 and following in Jonah 3. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. He's making the animals fast. I mean, this guy is grieved. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. And there was this huge spiritual awakening. Didn't start with the king, did not it? We, we tend to think that the spiritual awakenings are going to start with the geopolitical leaders, but it started with the people and made its way into the king's palace. The city was spared, lives were changed, and what did Jonah do? Well, he sulked. He was angry. I knew it. I knew it all along. Look what he says in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? 
That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Isn't it interesting? Most of the time when we say those words about God, we say them with joy in our hearts. We say them sometimes with tears coming down our faces because we're so grateful that God is so merciful. But he doesn't do that. He's mad about it. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. He just wanted to die. So he sat outside the city pouting. And God caused a vine to grow up and provide Jonah with shade. And now Jonah's happy because he's got a vine. And God caused a worm to attack the root and caused the wind to come and the heat to beat down and kill the vine. And he was unhappy again. Poor Jonah. Nothing's going his way. But I want you to look, and it all, here's the theme. Here's the theme of the whole story. God loved. This is the bottom line. God loved the people of Nineveh. God had compassion on the people of Nineveh. He loved them and had such compassion that he called to one of his prophets, one of the men of God, and said, go so that we can spare this city. And he did spare them, and Jonah just didn't get it. God was concerned about people, and Jonah was concerned about a vine. And this is my favorite thing about the book right here. It just ends. You ever notice that? You read through Jonah, and it just ends. It's like you bought a secondhand book, and you get to the end, and the last few pages are missing. In fact, many people have suggested that maybe that's what's happened with Jonah, is, is that, that part of it is actually missing. I don't think so. I think it's exactly the way God wants us to have it. I'll explain that, but I want to look at what we can learn. Let's consider how the story of Jonah applies to us. God is calling today everywhere we look. People are on a path to destruction, and God is calling. Look to the fields, Jesus said. They are white under the harvest. Pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out in the field. I'm convinced God is calling and calling and calling. And his people are running and running and running. Maybe not exactly like Jonah, but all the same. Now, you might say, Mike, you're at a seminary. You're preaching to people who have surrendered to God's call. We're not running. We are at seminary. You can run from God on the seminary campus. Remember when I first surrendered to the ministry, it wasn't a total unconditional surrender. For one thing, people would say, what's God calling you to? Now, I, I had met a guy in St. Louis one time. I was in a steak and shake in St. Louis, and I saw a guy reading his Bible, and I just struck up a conversation. Well, this is when I was in my previous career. Struck up a conversation. I said, what are you doing? He told me he's a church planter. I said, a what? He said, a church planter. I sat down with him, and he explained to me how he and his wife had just uprooted. They'd moved to town. They didn't have a church, and they just went to a neighborhood, prayed through a neighborhood, stopped and said, hey, this is it. We're going to start a church. I thought that was crazy. So people would say, what's God called you to do? I'd say, I don't know, but I'm not going to be a church planter. So I planted this church. <laughs> it's my first pastorate. Are you placing any limitations on your calling? Are you refusing? But not only that, what's God calling you to do right now that you're not doing? What's God calling you to do while you're at seminary? What is God calling you to do in the local church? You do realize that God's will for his people is to be connected to a local body of believers, right? And not just showing up, but connected, active, serving, involved. What is God calling you to do? And what are you doing to avoid hearing your call? We can drown out God's call with our educational pursuits. Let me just ask this. What are you doing to avoid sharing the gospel right now? Do you know that you live in one of the most unreached cities in America? Right now, we are in one of the most unreached cities in America. What are you doing to reach it? Do you think that God is not calling you to do anything to reach it? You need to listen then. What are you doing? What are you not doing? What excuses are you using? And I just, I'm curious if you have reasons that you're not trying to reach this city for Jesus. Which one of those do you think would work well with God? 
if God were to say, why aren't you reaching people for Jesus? Which excuse do you think would fly with him? Are you running? Listen, when we're in rebellion, things can get ugly. Now, things can get ugly when we're not in rebellion. Okay? We can face all kinds of terrible storms when we're right in the center of God. Sometimes God takes us into the center of a storm. Does he not? But you need to understand that disobedience can throw our lives into turmoil, and that affects everyone around us. Just as Jonah put everyone around him in peril, we too can put everyone around us in peril. My daughter turns 22 this month, and this summer she is going to live in an unreached indigenous village in Mexico. Can I just tell you that as a daddy, that is a scary thing. My little girl is going to live with no electricity, no running water, for two months in an unreached indigenous city in another country. And I've had people say, why are you letting your daughter do this? And my answer has been this. I believe that the safest place for my daughter to be is the center of God's will. I believe that if I were to keep her from pursuing what God has called her to do, that I would be endangering her and even endangering the rest of my family. I'm not going to stop her. When we rebel against God, we affect everyone around us. How are you affecting your church? How are you affecting your community? I'm afraid like Jonah so often, we're asleep. The world is a mess. And who do we blame? I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday. He's just so worried because our country is being destroyed by our president. We have a man in office just going to destroy, he's destroying our country. It's not even going to be a, be a country left anymore. I said, well, our country is definitely in a bad way and getting worse. And I said, you know who I blame? And he said, who? I said, I blame the Christians. What? I said, nowhere in Scripture can I find where God appoints a president to be the solution. I said, the problem with our world is a condition called sin, and the only solution to sin is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we Christians are sleeping instead of spreading the gospel, and we can sleep through it all that we want to, and we can point fingers at the White House and the Congress and to our state house and to the liberals and the secularists and the atheists. But let me tell you something. If you are not proclaiming the gospel to the ends of the earth, you are the problem. Don't put it off on somebody else. Wake up. If you're running, if you're sleeping, don't be surprised if you get gulped. Probably not by a fish. Maybe by a fish, but probably not by a fish. But I can tell you that God has used difficult things to wake me up. So much of my life would have been easier. I, we would have had a lot easier things if we just didn't run from God, wouldn't we have, Terry? A lot of things would have been easier. But let me encourage you, don't just relent. Don't just say, okay, fine. Embrace the gospel call. Embrace the great commission. Today, 600,000 people will die in our world. Today, 2 billion people on the planet have not been reached with the gospel. And God is calling you and me to do something about it. What a glorious privilege. It's no time to play games. It's not time to sleep right now how is God calling you to reach the world let me ask you, right now how is God calling you to reach the city in which you're placed your ministry does not start when you graduate embrace your calling not reluctantly but with joy if we'll get serious about reaching this city if we'll get serious about reaching the world something will happen I'm convinced people will respond Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe he didn't say a special program or the right methodology or the right church model is the power 
to save. He says the gospel is the power for salvation. When we are preaching the gospel, friends, people will respond. Is everyone going to respond? No, but here is the guarantee. I'm going to guarantee you of this. If we don't preach the gospel, no one will get saved. But listen, we need to be careful not to sulk. I've had, guys, it's funny. Over 20 years in ministry, I've seen some funny things that aren't funny, but they're funny. I've seen people mad because they lost their seat in church. I've seen people upset because there were too many new people in church. I've seen people mad because all these people that are becoming Christians aren't Baptist yet. I even had a lady, I kid you not, I am not making this up. You're going to accuse me of making this up. I'm not. I had a lady upset one day. She looked at me and she said, you sure have been wasting a lot of water with all those people you've been baptizing. What do you say to that? I I was speechless. Yes, me. Speechless. But you're saying, Mike, again, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. What about us in ministry? Well, let me tell you a story. I planted a church. I planted a church in Johnson County, Texas, just south of Fort Worth. Fort Worth is in Tarrant County. Johnson County is a county just south of that. I was in the Johnson County Baptist Association. It was remarkable to me to see the opposition that I received from pastors who didn't want me in their turf. It was interesting to me to see pastors who would not speak to me when I started planting that church. We had one town in our association, a town of about 6,000 people, had one Baptist church in it. We really wanted to put at least one more Baptist church there, and the pastor of that church would not let us do it. He said, I will oppose this effort. This is my town. My church has it covered. If there are any lost people who will respond to the gospel, they would have already responded at our church. We don't need more churches. I would ask you this. Can you celebrate when the church down the street is reaching people for Jesus? Or does that disappoint you? Can you celebrate when other people get the credit? Well, Jonah sulked, but God loved. He still does. He says, you're concerned about a vine? When there were 120,000 people on the line? God's heart is for people. Is yours? See, in the story of Jonah, we really have a a character contrast. We've got God and we've got Jonah. God loved people. Jonah didn't. Well, the book just ends. What did Jonah do? Did Jonah keep sulking? Did he repent? We don't know, and I think that's the point. I think that's why the book ends there, because we know what Jonah should do. We know what he should have done, don't we? We know exactly how the script, the script should have gone on. But the important question is not what did Jonah do, but what will we do? What will you do? Will you run from God? Will you sulk and be selfish? Or will you love? like God loves? Will you spend your life joyfully declaring his glory to a depraved world so that people might turn and be saved? This is the point. What will you do? Let's pray. Holy Father, we are reminded again today of your mercy, your compassion, your willingness to forgive. And I pray that we would reflect your heart. God, crucify within us our selfishness, our pettiness, 
our jealousy and give us a heart to reach the world for Jesus. It's in his name and for the sake of his kingdom that we pray. Amen.